We've been learning over the last several weeks that in Christ, everything, everything changes. We've been learning that changed lives demand changed behavior. But we've also been learning that changed lives desire changed behavior. And today, through the rest of Ephesians, we're going to see that changed lives develop into changed relationships. And, and I haven't been uh, titling these messages or anything, so if you want a title for today's message, if you're taking notes, here it is. The title is, What Does It Mean to Be Filled with the Spirit and How Does That Affect My Relationships? All right? So let's move on. Do you want me to slow down and say that again? What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit and how does that affect my relationships? Because how we are filled by the Spirit, it changes our relationships. It changes our relationships in our spouses or to our spouses. It changes our relationship to our children. It changes our relationships at work. And then finally, we're going to see it changes our relationship to the darkness and the fight and the battle for the world in the end of Ephesians chapter 6. So you're going to see this idea of being filled with the Spirit finishing out through the rest of Ephesians. So we need, to, we need to talk through that. What does that mean? So very simply this morning, we're going to ask the question, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? And how does that affect my relationship? So let's uh, take care of that first one. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? And can I just tell you that uh, I'm going to give you kind of a 20,000 foot view. Like if we're up in a plane, I'm going to give you that kind of a view of what it means to be filled with the Spirit because we could and probably will at some time in the future have an entire series on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. We could do this for weeks. don't have time to do that this morning, so we're going to kind of give you that overview, that look of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. If you'd like a, a pretty simple book to read, if you're a reader and you want a pretty simple book to read on this subject, Forgotten God by Francis Chan, Fantastic, easy read, really good starter, and kind of a primer to an understanding of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. But before we, before we can define what it means to be filled with the Spirit, we have to look at a contrast that Paul makes in order for us to understand what it means to be filled by the Spirit. So we're in Ephesians chapter 5, if you haven't turned there yet, um, or you could silently do it on your tech, techie devices, I don't know what to say there. Um, so we're in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 18. We stopped last week with verse 17, verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. All right, now you, you could, at this point in time, spend the next 35, 45 minutes in talking about this phrase, do not get drunk with wine because it is debauchery, or different translation, wherein it is excess. And, and we could take 35, 40 minutes to talk about that. But that's not the main subject here of, the, of what Paul's writing here. He's using it in contrast to don't be controlled by alcohol. Instead, be controlled by the Holy Spirit. He's just using it for contrast, okay? We could, we could jump off and spend a lot of time. I do want to spend a little bit of time. We need to talk about that phrase, and it's an important phrase. Do not get drunk with wine. We need to talk about that. But it sets up everything else all the way to the end of the letter in Ephesians chapter 6 to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we can't do that here. Though There could come a time when we do a topic series on the struggle of drunkenness. But we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about it this morning. Hope that doesn't put me back in this archaic box of uh, being old-fashioned and out of touch and irrelevant. The Bible's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, so when the Bible talks about it, we're going to talk about it, right? All right, good, good. Scripture always condemns drunkenness. It doesn't condemn drinking. I'll show you that. It condemns drunkenness. And every picture of drunkenness in the Bible, every single picture, you go from Genesis to Revelation, any picture of drunkenness in the Bible is connected to something sinful and to something that will destroy, Okay? It's a disaster that comes with drunkenness. And, and Proverbs 20, verse 1 says this. And by the way, Proverbs has a lot to say about drunkenness. Proverbs 20, verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, and strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is, this is the important piece, you can't just stop in Proverbs 21 and say, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. Stop. You can't do that with a text. You have to read it, all of it. And whoever is 
led astray by it is not wise. When you are controlled by it, you, you, you know, as a parent, you don't want your kids led astray by things. You want to be careful. You want to be intentional about who their friends are and what they're doing. You don't want them to be led astray. It's the same thing here. When you're led astray or when it's got power over you, it's that it's not wise. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 11, if you'll allow me to, I'll, I'll use a Jared paraphrase, okay? So just allow me to do that. Woe to the person that wakes up in the morning, the first thing they want to do is drink and spend the rest of their day drinking and stay up in the evening to drink because their liver is inflamed. It actually says their life. Their life is inflamed. They're engulfed by it. Woe to that person that is engulfed by this idea of drunkenness. But at the same time, Scripture's very clear and endorses wine, endorses alcohol. Drinking offering, drink offerings often accompanied Old Testament sacrifices. We see that. The psalmist wrote, there is a wine that brings gladness to the heart of man. In Isaiah 55 verse 1, Isaiah writes that you can go and buy, and, uh, buy milk and wine. And, and, and listen, I went to college, I sat in a Bible college, and, and, and I couldn't care less about the argument that wine in the olden days is different than the wine we drink today because of everything that uh, is done to it now to create a different kind of... There's a reason that Paul wrote in AD 60, the church at Ephesus, don't get drunk with wine. It doesn't matter that it was different in its essence, you could get drunk with it. That's the, that's the issue here. But in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, Paul, a missionary, says to a pastor, Timothy, hey, listen, I know you've got some stomach issues going on. We don't know any idea of what that is going on in his life. I'm going to guess that young Timothy, as leading a church, was having some ulcerative issues. And Paul says, man, Drink some wine, it will be a tenderness to your stomach. All right? So, I realize that what I'm about to say, some more things I'm about to say could put me inside of that box, but I think there's some really good questions for us to ask as Christians. Number one, is it necessary for me? Do I have to have it? Where alcohol, no long, I no longer have alcohol, but alcohol has me. Okay? There's a difference between drinking and drunkenness. Are you hearing that clearly? From me, are you making sure that Pastor Jared said we should never drink? Are you hearing that I'm not saying that? Okay, good, good, because then I would have to change some things. All right, it, is it necessary? Now, by all means, talk to the moms of young children during COVID, and they would tell you, it's quite possible they would tell you, it is absolutely necessary. It is absolutely necessary. But whether this is a flip side to that coin or not, over the last few years, we've seen more and more pastors having to step down and step back from leading their churches because it's been so stressful and so difficult and so hard to lead a church in this culture that it's led them to alcoholism. So is it necessary? Because the next question is, is it potentially destructive? Do you know your family history? Do you know that that's hereditary? Do you know that that can affect you? I realize that that can put me in a certain kind of a box, but just like last week when we talked about sexual immorality and pornography and I've seen the train wreck from that, I've also seen the train wreck of drunkenness. Remember when I said it's not a, just a car wreck, it's a train wreck? Because when the train wrecks, it affects everything else attached to it. It's the same thing with drunkenness. I, I have seen, we had a young lady in our youth group whose dad literally drank himself into the grave. We watched it happen, did everything we could, prayed over him, for him, for her, with her, as she watched her dad drink himself into the grave. I've seen financial waste, I've seen abuse, I've seen tanked marriages from it. Is it potentially destructive? You have to ask yourself that question. All right, now let's set that aside, okay? Because it's used as a contrast, are you controlled by some substance or 
Are you, as a Christian, controlled by the Spirit? That's the idea here. So what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Let me give you a, a few reasons or, or a few explanations of what it is to not be filled by the Spirit first. Before we finally get to answering that question, what it means to be filled by the Spirit, what does it not mean to be filled by the Spirit? It doesn't mean that if we get this special filled by the Spirit, that it's some kind of second blessing on our life, that we get some extra special gifts so that we can live this Christian life victoriously and not just normally. The problem with that is if you've read the Scriptures, you know that the normal Christian life is the victorious Christian life. So there's no need of a second blessing filling from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean the same as being possessed by the Holy Spirit or indwelt by the Holy Spirit or sealed by the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 1, I believe it was verse 13, it says we are sealed with the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption. It's not the same being filled with the Spirit isn't the same as possessing the Spirit or being indwelt by the Spirit or being sealed with the Spirit. Those things happen at the point of your salvation when you give, surrender your life to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when that happens. Same as baptism of the Spirit. Here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that at the time that you gave yourself to Christ and surrendered your life to Him, that you got a little bit of the Holy Spirit and every so often you need a little bit more of a filling. So when I gave my life to Christ at the age of almost six, I got 33 and a third percent of the Holy Spirit in me then when I got baptized and immersed in the waters at a church in Iowa, I got another 33 and a third percent of the Holy Spirit because he filled me just a little bit more. And so now until I die, I hope that God, because none of us are going to be perfect and get to 100 percent, I hope that the Holy Spirit will fill me another 33 and a third percent. Okay, we don't get degrees of the filling of the Holy Spirit. At salvation, you and I have the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, God Himself, living in His fullness to us. So what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? We could have this picture in our mind that being filled with the Spirit is a glass of water, and once it is completely full, an empty glass, once it's completely filled with water, or for some of you if it helps, coffee, or if with the really godly people, Mountain Dew, if it were completely filled, you're like, all right, now I'm filled with the Spirit, but that's not what it means. It means to actually be controlled by the Spirit, and the best way that I could illustrate this is with a, with a glove, okay? Uh, just a couple of days ago, Pastor Josh and I, we went outside over here, and we took a few uh, T-posts, and we pounded them into the ground with this uh, T-post driver right here, and uh, there, was, there was a I had a pair of gloves, and so I, I could have easily gone outside here with this T-post driver and this glove and set it down just like that. And I said, hey, Josh, we're going to come back outside in about 20 minutes. The glove should be able to get the work done. The T-post should be able to go on the ground. We'll just come back out. We'll hang the lights, right? So let's go, let's go inside. You, the glove can't do that, right? The glove is not going to pick up this instrument and use it until the glove is filled and controlled by something, is it able to use the instrument that it's supposed to use? It's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. Until we are, until we are filled and then controlled, that's when we will experience the fullness of life that God has designed for us because we are allowing ourselves to be used by him. And there are then three pictures of what that looks like. What does it look like to be filled by the Spirit? Three things happen, and then we'll see it throughout the rest of Ephesians chapter 6. Do not get drunk with wine, for it is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Be controlled by the Spirit, addressing one another or speaking to one another. So once we are controlled, I should have left the glove on. Once we are controlled by the Holy Spirit, it changes things. It changes our relationships. We begin to address one another. This is weird. We begin to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Hey, Greg. I'm going to sing from the Psalter. 
to you. Okay, let me open up Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11. How does a young man keep his way pure? Yeah, <laughs> it would be weird, right? Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You know, it just seems weird, right? But the idea here is that we're filled with the Spirit. We're going to speak to one another in Psalms. Those are the Psalters, songs of the Psalms. Hymns are songs of praise to God. We're going to address one another in hymns of praise to God. Spiritual songs, nothing more than testimonials and, and the overall broadband spectrum of who God is. And we're going to speak these to one another. We're going to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Man, that seems weird. And then he goes on and he says, singing and making melody to the Lord. The word singing there literally means vocalizing our praise and making melody in in the original language means plucking an instrument. So we're going to sing and we're going to use instruments and it's going to prove that we are filled with the Spirit. So, like it or not, God created us in such a way that when we experience the filling of the Holy Spirit, it produces music it produces music in you and it produces music in me and it doesn't even matter if you have a loud or if you have a great voice if you've been a student of music and and you have this incredible voice it doesn't have anything to do with that and I've been at concerts where people are singing at the top of their lungs and there's two things that are happening either they're drunk with wine <laughs> Or they're filled with the Spirit and and there's this liveliness and this joy because I'm going to vocalize the fact of the truth. And and so whether you like it or not, God has created music within us to be used to glorify Him. And it doesn't matter whether or not you can sing. I stood by my grandfather in the pews of a Baptist church in Ames and that dude could not sing or carry a tune in a bucket. But every single hymn that we sang, he sang it an octave and a half lower than anyone else. And it sounded terrible. But I, I get it now. I get it. He's being filled with the Spirit and had that joy within him. See, see, when we're filled with the Spirit, we sing. We make melody to the Lord with our hearts and then this happens giving thanks always for everything to God giving thanks always when when we're when we're blessed in everything or for everything to God the Father when we're blessed we give thanksgiving when we hope that there's future blessing and victory over things we we are thankful for future blessing if 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 God didn't do anything else but give us our salvation we can be thankful for that but what other blessings does he bestow upon you each and every day of your life each and every day of my life in that future blessing and that future victory to come am i thankful for everything to God the Father and then this one in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the fight, can you? This is the true proof in the pudding that you are being filled with the Spirit. If in the midst of struggle, hard time, battle against Satan, battle against Ephesians chapter 6, the principalities and the powers of this world, if you can give thanks in the midst of the battle, you are being filled with the Spirit. But then there's a third thing that happens, and this carries out through the rest of Ephesians. Verse 21, submitting to one another out of fear-inducing awe for Christ. You see, when we're filled with the Spirit, not only will we sing, not only will we show it, not only will we prove it, not only will we give thanks, but we'll actually give up our own authority and self for the betterment of others because we are so awe-inspired by who God is. That should be an outpouring of the Spirit. And ultimately that would prove to us as a church, and this is what God does next through the Apostle Paul. He gives us a picture of what that looks like. He addresses one another. He says this, addressing one another. Then he says this, submitting to one another. And then he leads us into what we're going to talk about the rest of the morning. And it's answering the question, how does being filled with the Spirit affect my marriage? Now, you're going to be tempted. 
uh, to sit back and go, all right, either one or, t- one or two things may happen. Uh, uh, all right, I don't want don't to hear anything about marriage. <laughs> or maybe you're not married and you're like, oh, this, isn't, this doesn't have anything to do with me. All right, spoiler alert. Can I give you a spoiler alert here? All right, let's look at verse 32 before we back up and look at verse 22. Everything that's said about marriage and about unity in a marriage, everything that's said about it, or the submission, the love, the care, the respect in marriage that leads to unity, all of that is a mystery. It's profound. In verse 32, the mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Spoiler alert. Even though he's going to use the example of the marriage between a husband and a wife, as a picture of Christ's love for the church, that's what it's all about. That's what submission looks like. When Christ, before he went to the cross, said, if there's any possible way for this cup to pass for me where I won't have to go to the cross, let it pass for me. Nevertheless, Father, not my will be done, but your will be done. He submitted himself to the plan of the Father. Why? Because he was unequal? Because God was something greater than he was? Jesus is fully God and fully man, but recognized his role of submission to the Father. And you're going to see that play out here with that word submission. I'm absolutely going to talk to married people this morning. But this is part of Paul's letter to show us the beauty of Christ's submission to his Father. And, it, and he wants to expand our understanding. And, and uh, side note, I'm, I'm going to talk to marriages today. We are absolutely drowning in information on marriages. More than ever before, more books are being written. They're being put out there quicker than ever before. More conferences, not so much with COVID, but you could, you could spend almost every single weekend uh, in the United States, finding a place where you could go to a marriage conference. And there, there are crazy amounts of these things, books and conferences and everything on, on marriage. And, 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 and I'm, I'll be the first to tell you, there are some great books out there. Some of my favorites, uh, Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts by the Parents. Um, uh, 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 the Meaning of Marriage, man, by Timothy Keller. So, so good. There's so many great books out there. There's so many. Julie and I have been to marriage conferences. There are good conferences out there. But hear me. There's not a single conference and there's not a single book that's going to fix your marriage. What's going to fix your marriage, what's going to give you strength in your marriage is if you and your spouse are being filled by the Holy Spirit of God so that you will take that information and it won't be temporary, it won't be short-lived, you won't find yourself back in the same irrelevant places of struggle and pain and habitual sin. Why? Because you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Those things are absolutely great. But if you and I won't willingly Allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. And man, I forgot to say this, and this is so important. That phrase, be filled with the Spirit, in the original language means keep being filled by the Spirit. It's a passive, present imperative. Uh, um, Indicative, imperative, indicative, imperative. Imperative, thank you so much. Uh, Yeah, be filled, it's command. Yeah, so, but it's it's that passive tense. So you're not doing it, it's happening to you. The Holy Spirit is filling you. That's important for us to note in the text because the word subject, be subject to or submit to, in verse 21, the word submit is the original language word is the word hupotasso. It's a military term. It's a term of ranking. It's a general spiritual attitude that true believers, every true believer in every relationship would submit themselves to one another. And then in verse 22, Paul writes this, two wives, wives to your own husbands. The word submit isn't in the original language in verse 22. It's a continuation of verse 21. So as we submit to one another, wives to their husbands, there's not a period. Because you're going to see as husbands love their wives, as Christ loved the church, they have, men have, husbands have, submitted to the authority of Christ in their life. That word hupotasso is a military term that means to willingly place yourself under. Ladies, let me, let me apologize. 
If you've ever been on the receiving end of the misuse and abuse of this text and this word submit. If it meant in some way, shape, or form, if some pastor stood before you or if some other teacher stood before you and said that this is inequality and that you should be ruled over or lorded over by your husband, they have lied and they have taken this out of context. And I apologize to you if you've ever heard that you are something less than man. This text is on the culpability and on the onus of the husband. If he leads as a spirit-led husband, as a spirit-led leader, as a spirit-filled wife, you'll follow that leadership. You're not commanded to obey here. You're commanded to lovingly submit to the authority of Christ by authoritative of your husband. I know it sounds archaic and irrelevant and old, but God didn't write these things. God doesn't have these things thinking that someday we would know better in our culture than he does. He loves you and your marriage way more than Satan hates your marriage. Then he says this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. In everything. And man, this is, this is where abuse just absolutely happens. I've sat, sat counseling others where, where man, if she would just obey, if she would just come underneath my authority, if she would just submit to me. <laughs> so much abuse. Because the Bible says in everything to their husbands. You have to know Ephesians chapter 5 isn't an exhaustive theological treatise on marriage. The Bible is replete, and there's plenty of places in Scripture that give us more information about what it means to live in marriage as Christ loves the church. From Genesis chapter 2, 24, which we'll look here shortly, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where the wife's body does not belong to her and the husband's body does not belong to him. And then he talks about the beauty and and love and the desire and the intimacy of sex in 1 Corinthians 7. Song of Solomon takes this relationship from dating all the way to the honeymoon, all the way to the sexual intercourse, all the way to the end where they're fully and completely enthralled with each other in marriage. 1 Peter chapter 3, one verse for women, six verses for men. Reverse that. In Ephesians, more verses for men, one for women. In 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, I'll do better in the second service. 1 Peter chapter 3, you have uh, one verse for men. No. Yes. One verse for men. Live with your wife in an understanding way as a weaker vessel. Yes. So one verse for men, several for women. That just obliterated everything I was going to say this morning. Just know this, that this is not exhaustive theology here. Because submission is always conditional. Your submission is always, my submission is conditional on obedience to God. Submission isn't mindless. Wives, it's not mindless. You're an image bearer. You've been made with the intellect and emotion and will. Your value is equal. Your value is great before God. Submission has nothing to do with ability or or, or inequality. It has everything to do with quality and and with equality and with order. And any man who demands his wife's submission, any man who demands his wife's submission to him is nothing more than a bully. And he distorts his own obligation to come underneath the submission of Christ who is the head of the church and gave himself up for her. And so it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So I willingly submit myself to the authority of Christ and my submission to Christ is proved by how I love my wife. Gentlemen, the onus is on us. You want something, you're expecting something out of your wife, don't distort your own obligation to submit to God's standard. And he goes on and tells us what that is. 
Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. What does this spirit-filled love look like? Spirit-filled husbands reflect Christ by loving their brides. And how do they do it? According to Paul in verse 25, they do it sacrificially. Jesus, or Paul says that Jesus gave, willingly gave himself up. It's sacrificial. It's a call to serve. It's a call to die, to die to yourself. It, at some point in time, it won't take long. Get on YouTube, type in Matt Chandler, men should be tired. And watch it. I think it's like eight, ten, eight to ten minutes. One of the best little snippets of his messages, I think, on why men should be tired. It's a sacrificial love. It's a sanctifying love. You want to see her grow spiritually. Verse 26. That he might sanctify her. That word sanctify means to set apart. To honor her. You want to see husbands. You want to see your wife grow spiritually. I get up every morning and walk out to my living room and my wife is sitting there with her computer and her Bible growing spiritually. You want to see that. You want to be a part of that. He says that that love of Christ for the church is a purifying love in verse 27. I only want what's best for her. I, don't defile her. Don't objectify her. Don't use her. Don't abuse her. Adore her. Take pleasure in her beauty. Take pleasure in her purity. The husband who loves his wife because of her physical attraction or temperament or her capacity to meet his own selfish needs does not love her like Christ loves the church. It's a nourishing love. It's a cherishing love. Verse 29. Now Paul says in verse 28 that in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Verse 29. For this reason, for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Husbands, our love for our wives should be a nourishing love. We should provide for her needs. When she needs strength, we should give it. When she needs encouragement, we should give it. But it's also a cherishing love in verse 29. It's tender, it's physical affection, it's warmth, it's comfort, it's protection, and it's security. And if I were to ask Julie to come up and stand next to me right now, she would tell you, ladies, that anyone that says that they don't need security or protection from their husband, they're, they're tricking themselves. Because a spirit-filled woman and a spirit-filled man being united together in marriage is a picture of Christ's love for the church, and Christ protects his church and makes us secure. And I can tell you, I've married a very strong and very talented and very able woman who says, I will come under your leadership as a spirit-filled husband. It's nourishing, it's cherishing as Christ loved the church. I know we're almost out of time, but hang with me for a little bit. Verse 31, Paul then reaches all the way back to Genesis 2.24 and he says, a man will leave his father and mother and adhere to, cling to, be glued to, stick to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. One flesh. When we're filled by the Spirit and we're loving our wives the way that Christ loved the church, because verse 29 and 30 tells us to, because we are members of his body, just as Christ does the church, there's a permanence and there's a priority to your marriage. There's a permanence and a priority to being a part of the body of Christ. To be spirit-filled church goers. To be spirit-filled Christians. There's a permanence and a priority. When it comes to marriage between a husband and wife, there's a partnership of body that's expressed sexually. There's a partnership of mind that's expressed in communication and being on the same page. But there's partnership of soul here. And, and, and it's not uh, uh, like soulmates. It's not, we finish each other's sandwiches. It's not one of those types of soulmate time. Do anybody know where I got that from? All right, so it's not that type of partnership of soul. It's expressed in this spiritual union that 
that we have when we are being filled by the Spirit and it's drawing us closer to God. I say this all the time when we do premarital counseling and just got done with another couple, can't wait, going to marry them here shortly. Uh, but I tell them, do not, while you're engaged, have uh, devotions together. Don't do devotions together. Don't do quiet time together. Because as you're filled with the Spirit and drawing closer to God, there's something spiritual happening there that's going to draw you closer to each other. <laughs> you shouldn't draw closer to each other yet. Okay? So be very, very careful of that because there's something very significant. Something is happening in the heavens. So how does being filled with the Spirit affect my marriage? This is God's idea. God's idea, he says, this mystery, this whole idea is profound, and I love it. Paul David Tripp talks about how crazy and profound and hilarious is it that God would take two severely selfish individuals and think it would be a great idea to put them together in marriage and say, the two of you will be for one flesh the rest of your lives together. <laughs> a creative God would do that. How crazy is it that a creative God would take a whole bunch of us who are incredibly different, who are united together by the Holy Spirit, and say, I want you to come together as different as you are, even if you think differently, even if you process differently, even if you look differently, and I want you to have this stick to glued to, adhered to relationship with one another in the body of Christ. He's talking about a spiritual unity here. This goes way past just husbands and wives. This is a picture of how Christ loved the church and that in the Trinity, in the Godhead, each one of them, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are absolutely equal with different roles. But there's this unity and that's what God is calling us to. There's no doubt. Marriages and churches are under differing degrees of strain. It could be something within marriages. could be something from outside of marriages that cause strain. When there's stress in other places of our lives, it can cause strain on our marriages. And despite the, despite the impression that we give on Sunday mornings, no marriage is without difficulties and no marriage is without some regrets. Okay? In this moment, I could say, could I get a witness so that I wouldn't be alone up here? That sometimes marriage is difficult and we live with regrets. But when we allow ourselves to be filled with the Spirit, then we allow ourselves to experience gospel-driven forgiveness. And it's the glue that sticks, uh, it sticks our imperfect marriages together. Will you let me, just for the next couple of moments here, and we'll be done, would you allow me to do something really practical with you? Uh, she doesn't know this. Julie, would you uh, come? Oh, she hates it. I just saw the eye roll. Uh, saw the eye roll and the look. And so I'm going to turn my back. And Julie, would you come up on the platform for a moment? Thank you, sweetheart, so much for being a willing volunteer today. Uh, just want to practice something very, very practical in a marriage and in the body of Christ. And I missed this a couple weeks ago when I spoke on um, Ephesians 4.32 that says, Be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And I think in our marriages and I think in our churches, we suck at asking for forgiveness. We stink. We stink at asking. We don't know how. And I just want to be very practical in this moment. I've wronged Julie at some point in our marriage. <laughs> uh, in this moment, I'm gonna ask forgiveness for this moment right now. Uh, um, th this, is, this is what forgiveness looks like. Julie, I am, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna ask forgiveness later for having you come up here. But I am, I'm so sorry, uh, and, and we'll use this. I'm so sorry for asking you to come up here. It's outside of your comfort zone. It wasn't, it wasn't kind, it wasn't kind to surprise you. I need to ask your forgiveness. Will you forgive me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. That's very gracious. Okay. okay. For that, yes, go ahead. You can, you can go ahead. Uh, no, let's stay. Let's stay. Okay. Let's stay. There's another side of this that's extremely important. And, and to know that when, once you have laid out the offense, I'm sorry for, lay out the offense, will, will you forgive me? That puts the ball in their court. They have every opportunity at that point to say no, or I need time, or Give me some time. We, want, we need to talk more about that. There's some space in there for that. 
But what, what I don't need to hear, let's turn the tables. Let's say she's asked my, she's asked my forgiveness. I, I, don't, I don't go, man, if, if you need my forgiveness so that you feel better about what you've done to me, then by all means, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll be the bigger person and I'll grant you forgiveness. That's bogus. You've just filled yourself up with some kind of pride uh, thinking that you're somehow better and you're valued more than that other person because they, they deserve my forgiveness. The, the gracious way is to say, yes, I forgive you. And although I may not forget it, I promise not to bring it up again. And that's how, thank you. You may, you may be seated. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate that. And I'll ask for more forgiveness later from that. See, ultimately, this passage isn't simply about, uh, it, it's not about our marriage. There, there's some great marital things in here. But this is about, at a deeper level, because of verse 32, at a deeper level, this is about our relationship in the body of Christ to each other. This is about being one in Christ as we are his church. This is about fighting against division. This is about fighting against unity. This is about fighting against spiritual divorce by submitting in humility to one another to show that we value each other and that we need each other and that we love each other. It's this great, profound mystery. Husbands, you and I, we're absolutely going to be held accountable for the spiritual walk of our family. Wives, spirit-filled wives, you absolutely are going to be held accountable for a spirit-filled life lived in submission and from what Ephesians says, respect of your husband. Absolutely. But at a bigger level, church, together, you and me, we're going to be held accountable for being spirit-filled and whether we've caused division in a church or whether we've brought unity in humility, submitting toward one another. We're going to be held accountable to it. And, and Paul says that to us. 